Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, today's CBME seminar. Uh, my name is Sumitra Menon. I'm the Deputy Director at the Center for Biomedical Ethics at um, the Yong Lun School of Medicine at NUS. And it's my great pleasure to be chairing today's session. We have three speakers for you today, followed by um, a short uh, Q&A dialogue at the end of the session after all three speakers have completed their talks. Um, I think some of you may know that we've had a, a little change in plan today um, because uh, Professor Hank Grayley unfortunately was unable to make it at the last minute. So uh, instead we've got Professor Julian Savalescu who has kindly stepped in um, to give a talk today and actually we're going to be starting with that talk first. So a quick introduction, I think, for Julian before he gets up here. So Julian is the Chen Sulan Professor in Medical Ethics at NUS, where he directs our Center for Biomedical Ethics. He's an award-winning ethicist and moral philosopher and trained in neuroscience, medicine, philosophy. He went on to hold the Uhiro Chair in Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford, where he founded the Oxford Uhiro Center for Practical Ethics in 2003 before uh, moving to NUS last year. So it's my great pleasure to invite Julian to give his talk on philosophy and the regulation of technology, the example of gene editing. Yes, thanks very much, Sumi, and sorry about the, uh, the problems with the um, speakers. Um, so ethics is like physics. Um, in physics, you have vectors of force, and they push in a certain direction. Um, with an amount of force. And to determine which way the ball will go, um, you have to weigh the different vectors. In ethics, the vectors are reasons. And those reasons have a different direction and strength depending on the circumstances. Um, regulation is fundamentally about ethics. Take a simple example. What should the speed limit be? We have to weigh the relevant reasons. Safety speaks in favour of a slower speed limit. Carbon emissions, a slower speed limit. Convenience, a higher speed limit. Economic efficiency, a higher speed limit. We have to weigh all of these different reasons, and ethics and philosophy are about how to weigh those reasons. So tonight I just want to give one very small example of the power of philosophy to influence regulation through the lens of the example of, of gene editing. So you, you're all familiar with, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, um, he Jiang Kui, I'm not sure if that's correct, um, JK as he calls himself, um, who gene edited two babies in 2018 to international uproar. Importantly, this was an example of human enhancement, not medical treatment, um, but we can discuss that in the question time. There were some basic ethical problems with this research. Um, he took normal healthy embryos um, that would have resulted in, in, in normal babies. And he deleted the CCR5 gene to attempt to make these future children immune to HIV. Um, but these embryos were exposed to the risks of gene editing, of off-target mutations, developmental abnormalities, tumours, and so on, without anything to gain. Uh, so they were exposed to risks, so there was a negative vector but no positive vector for them. Because of course HIV can be avoided through um, social um, actions, through um, protected intercourse, not having infected blood transfusions, and it can also be treated. Um, there are other co ethical complexities to what he did because he used sperm washing and antiretrovirals to enable these children to be free of HIV, but again we can discuss that in the question time. So essentially he exposed children to an unreasonable risk. Now shortly before he was forced to announce the birth of Lulu and Nana, um, he gave this talk at Cold Spring Harbour. And he finished his talk, it was about the, uh, the, say, the ability to detect off-target mutations through whole genome sequencing. He finishes his talk on a, on a point of ethics and this is what he says. This is uh, a gene editing uh, for human, uh, a germline, uh, you're going to have um, in the future or near future. So I want to remind everyone, we, we should do this game slow and with caution. 
it uh, because uh, a single case of failure, uh, failure will may kill the entire field, just like uh, this case, the, the biotech death of uh, just cancer the, for the gene therapy. Okay, so uh, without a thank you for your attention. Okay, so he, I'm not sure if you could understand that, but essentially says we have to progress very slowly mm -hmm. uh, because a single um, so mistake could end the field of, um, of gene editing. And we have to remember the case of Jesse Gelsinger. Um, but ironically, what, what JK did was exactly the mistake that was done in the Gelsinger case, as I'm now going to show you. And I'm going to show you how the failure to understand ethics and philosophy continues even amongst experts in the world in the United States. So, uh, when I took over the editorship of the Journal of Medical Ethics in 2000, there had just been this very catastrophic death that essentially set the field of gene therapy back by, by many years um, in the United States. And it involved this young man called Jesse Gelsinger, who was an 18-year-old who had a genetic disorder called OTC deficiency, which meant his body didn't metabolize nitrogen normally. So he had to modify his diet. Um, and it was controlled with diet and drugs. And he had a normal life expectancy and a normal quality of life. So on September the 13th, the world's expert in gene therapy um, injected um, a large number of adenovirus um, vector particles with the gene therapy in an attempt to cure this disease. And, and Gelsinger died four days later of a massive immune reaction. And this was the first death that was the result of gene therapy. And this led to the Institute for Human Gene Therapy being shut down um, and a number of lawsuits, including a lawsuit against the ethicist involved, Art Kaplan, who had advised on the, on the um, structure of the trial. Because there had been a discussion prior to setting up the trial. Wilson was faced with a decision. There are two versions of OTC deficiency, a severe version which results in death in the first year of life, or the mild version, which results in normal life expectancy, which is what Gelsinger had. So you could either do the trial on infants with the severe version of the disorder, or adults with the mild version of the disorder. And so Wilson was saying, who should we do it on? Should we do it on the infants, or should we do it on the adults? And, and my colleague, Art Kaplan, um, advised Wilson to do it on the adults. And, and his advice was in line with the Declaration of Helsinki, which states that where you can do a trial, either on adults or on children or other incompetent patients, you should choose adults who can consent. And the rationale is something like, there's a serious risk with these sorts of experiments, and that it's better that, that adults who can consent to those risks take part in the trial. I'm going to show that this prioritises consent over harm. So it gives greater weight to the vector of consent and less weight to the vector of harm. Because when we consider the concept of harm, Gelsinger had a lot to lose, a normal life, and nothing to gain, essentially. He could have got off some drugs and been able to liberate his diet. That's it. So the cost-benefit ratio for Gelsinger was highly against engaging in this trial. The, as I'll talk about, the concept of expected harm, the probability of the harm multiplied by the value of the harm, a whole life, um, was large. The newborn had something to gain, perhaps it would have cured the disease, and nothing to lose, a few months of extra life. So in fact, if you if your goal was what's called in, in bioethics non-maleficence, not harming, of minimising expected harm, you should have done the trial on the newborns, not on the adults, it, despite what the Declaration of Helsinki says. Um, so this decision of, of how to structure the trial was literally a life and death decision for Gelsinger. So the concept of expected harm is the idea of the probability of a harm multiplied by the value. And given the same probability of death, Gelsinger stands to lose 70 years, the infant one year. 
much less expected harm in the trial being conducted on, on, on newborns. The extension of this is that we should choose participants in risky experiments who have the shortest life expectancy, the lowest probability of survival, and the poorest quality of life. So if you accept my argument that we should aim to minimise expected harm and maximise expected benefit, then this is the way in which we should regulate. So this has straightforward implications for regulation. We can put some figures on this, which I won't bore you with, but essentially the expected harm was two orders of magnitude of Gelsinger participating. It was the wrong design. He took a healthy individual and exposed them to unnecessary risks. That's the lesson of the Jesse Gelsinger case. And what does he, Jan, he Jan, Quay, or Jan Quay do? Exactly the same. He takes embryos with normal life expectancy and exposes them to unnecessary risk. And this is very familiar in ethics. I've spent 30 years in this field and, you know, studying every day. On, and you get people like, you know, Her Jan Quay, who also gave an ethics lecture, telling us what the ethics lessons of a particular case are and getting it 180 degrees around the wrong way. So let's fast forward to 2018 and the analysis of, 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 um, of Her Jan Quay's mistakes. So George Daly, the Dean of Harvard Medical School, School says, look, the problem is he took healthy embryos. He should have taken embryos with genetic disorders, severe genetic disorders. So there was some prospect of benefit and less to lose. He's roughly employing the concept of minimising expected harm. But then he goes on to say, conditions like Huntington's disease or Tay-Sachs disease. Now in Huntington's disease, you have 40 normal years and then 40 years or then 20 years of severe disability and death. Tay-Sachs disease, you have, you die in the first year or two of life. Very different conditions. He's wrong. You should have started with Tay-Sachs embryos and if it was safe in those, later moved to Huntington's disease. So even somebody like George Daly hasn't quite got the lesson of the Gelsinger death or what He Jan Kuei has done. So I've proposed this five stage translational pathway of performing gene editing in a responsible way. And I could have defended JK if he had done that experiment on Tay-Sachs embryos because the Tay-Sachs individual has something to gain and nothing to lose. And there are other more severe conditions like BRAT1 and other gen genetic disorders that are, that are lethal in, in, in the embryonic stage of development. So the first thing you do with gene editing is start with those conditions. That was the lesson that I learned 20 years ago, or over 20, 25 years ago nearly, from the, from the Jesse Gelsinger death. And once you've shown it's safe there, you take other conditions that fundamentally affect our humanity and our rational agency, although these are chromosomal disorders, if they are amenable to gene editing, you would then move into these kinds of conditions. And only if it was shown to be safe in those, you would then move into conditions with adult onset or severe childhood onset diseases with some prospect of, of quality of life and some length of life. And ultimately, if it's shown to be safe in those cases, you could move on to do what He Jan Kuei did, and that is try to confer immunity to infection um, or reduce the probability of common diseases through polygenic interventions. But you need to move through these stages carefully, and he jumped all the way to stage four. And ultimately, you could enhance normal human characteristics, just as we had attempt to enhance with other biological means through diet, um, if it was shown to be safe in those preceding conditions. So this is a staged pathway that would enable us to conduct experiments in human beings on gene editing, starting with lethal conditions. And it involves this concept of expected harm, which also applies to embryo research, embryoid research, organoid research, and it also applies to, to um, risky research, such as challenge studies. So with colleagues here, we've distinguished between two kinds of embryo research, Embryo research that results in the destruction of embryos, where there is no future person who could be exposed to risk and harm, and embryo research which doesn't result in the destruction of the embryo that potentially exposes that individual to future harm. And that second category of research is much more problematic than the first, even though law in this country treats them equivalently. 
So this is how philosophy can help us to focus on the real problems and help us to make progress in these controversial issues. We've also analysed the concepts of coercion and exploitation and written on the issue of payment of participants in, in research, even risky research such as challenge studies, and, and payment and other incentives um, to encourage vaccination in the, in the pandemic. Um, we've also used um, philosophical concepts to argue um, for models of regulation in um, the use of polygenic scores in reproduction. So philosophy is extremely important. It's half um, of, of the issue of regulation. The other half is science. Science about what the safety of different speeds are. Um, we need to know those facts in order to, to implement policy. But it's also important um, in the area of forming policy. So we propose this model called collective reflective equilibrium in practice, which brings together ethical theories, concepts and principles. Um, the, the bottom right hand um, box, but also surveys and focus groups and citizens' juries of ordinary people's opinions. And what we try to do is to bring these into coherence. So a full-blown approach to forming policy on gene editing would, would be to outline this concept of expected harm, but then in a fine-grained way to see what people's attitudes were to different structures of experiments involving human beings. Um, so, just briefly, we've, just to give you another example of the flavour of, of how this might work, we've recently asked the general public about the use of artificial intelligence to allocate livers for transplantation. Um, I'm going to pass quickly through these, the, the, these results to get to, to the, the main result I want to focus on. But interestingly, people are very supportive of using artificial intelligence to inform allocation decisions. Um, they're not more likely to decide not to donate their organs if artificial intelligence is, is used. The characteristic that is most important in artificial intelligence that, that, uh, for ordinary people is accuracy. Um, importantly, um, interpretability is not important or, or empathy is not that important for ordinary people. Um, with, with relationship to... Um, you know, whether they, uh, let's pass over that. Um, we also asked them about whether they um, were, were prepared to take into account behavioural factors, such as compliance um, or alcohol use. And we found that um, uh, people, sorry, compliance versus immunological um, uh, problems. And we found that people, there was a significant difference that people did think it was more reasonable to take into account immunological predictions of rejection rather than predictions of people's compliance. But interestingly, the majority thought that predictions of patient compliance by artificial intelligence could be employed. Um, now, the idea of collective reflective equilibrium in practice is we don't just accept these preferences. We have to give them a philosophical grounding. And, um, so the majority did support uh, taking into account predictions of compliance um, and they did uh, also uh, take into account some uh, measures um, of behaviour. So we, I want to finish on this slide. We asked them about a, a bunch of different factors that are commonly discussed in relationship to organ transplantation. Urgency, survival of the, of the um, individual, um, number of life years gained, um, the age of the individual, medical compliance, quality of life, future alcohol use, past alcohol use, past crime, future crime. And you'll see that people were comfortable in the same way as they were in taking these, account, these factors into account compared to transplant committees. So one of the challenges of formulating policy in this area, whether it's for a transplant committee or for the programming of artificial intelligence, either by programming certain values or in using it, you know, a la large language models to analyse transplant committee decisions, is to decide which of these factors ought to be taken into consideration. And that requires ethical deliberation. 
So with my colleague Dolly, Dominic Wilkinson, we've done similar work in allocating ventilators during the pandemic and, and did surveys of, of um, opinion which is very similar to these um, results around organ transplantation. And we argued that probability of survival and duration of use of the ventilator is an obligatory ethical requirement because it maximises the number of people, the number of lives that you save. And then we discussed a number of optional elements such as age, quality of life, um, responsibility for, for illness, contribu social contribution, dependence and so on. But you see, in, in order to form policy here, we both need to know what the public think but we also need philosophical analysis to ground what we ask the public and then also to process what we ask them. So let me finish there and say that regulation fundamentally involves ethics. And probably in my experience, the, the greatest obstacle to forming good regulatory policy is being unaware that there are values that can be contested, that can be challenged, and not making an explicit process for weighing those different values and coming to a justified ethical decision. Thank you. We've certainly done very well on time, on, literally on the dot. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Julian. Um, our, ne our next speaker is um, Professor Simon Chesterman. So Simon is the David Marshall Professor and Vice Provost of Educational Innovation at NUS, where he's also the founding dean of NUS College. He serves as Senior Director of AI Governance at AI Singapore and editor of the Asian Journal of International Law. He was previously the dean at NUS Law from 2012 to 22 and is the co-president of the Law School's Global League from 2021 to 2023. Well, that's a bit of a mouthful. So <laughs> please join me in welcoming Simon, who will speak on why, when, and how to regulate artificial intelligence. So it's a great pleasure to be speaking with you, and I hope we'll have a kind of nice transition between the three presentations. Julian really starting off with the fundamental way in which ethics should inform regulation. I'll be talking about the policy-making process, and then I'm really looking forward to in Sue's presentation sort of operationalizing this in the context of stem cell research, which is an example I might touch on in passing. Um, but yes, I come at this from a legal perspective, um, and I'll be talking about the why, when, and how of regulation. Um, but um, one of the ways in which I handle these multiple portfolios that were sort of referenced in the introduction is that I'm fundamentally lazy. Uh, and so um, before today's presentation, uh, I thought I'd ask ChatGPT to help me with the presentation. And so I said, well, why is, what, what's the problem with AI and regulation and why is it a challenge? And ChatGPT, as is as it want, gave me this kind of pretty earnest but boring response, yes, basic definition of computer systems, warning about it changing all the time, yes, you've got to be careful about the data, be wary about bias, a bit too long, too boring to read out. So I said, look, can you do this more succinctly? And this is actually something AI is very good at, the large language models. Um, so AI is development intelligent machines that can perform human-like tasks, uh, and challenges arise because of the need for high-quality data, cost ethical concerns, at least the machines are aware of the ethical concerns, uh, and potential job displacement. Um, about one word, I thought, well, challenging. Not bad. Um, so what are the problems? And what I'm going to walk through is what I see as some of the challenges for regulators and then very quickly go through what kind of regulations we might need, although, as I'll point out, I think that's the wrong question, um, why we want to regulate, and that brings in some of the values that Julian was pointing to, when to regulate, that's important for a small jurisdiction like Singapore, and then the how and the who, and then hopefully that's a good segue into in Sue's presentation. So what is the harm that we're worried about? And there is a lot of talk about existential risk about AI. It's kind of shocking that many people deeply involved in AI research will say, yeah, there's maybe a 10% chance that the work I'm doing will end humanity. Um, I'm actually not so worried, particularly I'm not worried, I'm not losing sleep at night about the large language models being these kind of beasts that are going to take over. Um, I'm much more worried about humans. So I assume, is anyone, okay, who has used ChatGPT? Okay, students, who has used it? No, I'm not going to ask that. Um, 
ChatGPT um, will do things you ask, and very quickly there was someone who developed an API, a program interface, and gave a ChatGPT extension the explicit task, destroy humanity. Now, this was kind of shocking, surprising, nothing to do with the AI, but with what humans will do with the AI. And that's what I'm much more worried about in terms of AI, is what humans will do with it or allow it to do. Uh, and in addition to the person who programmed ChatGPT interface to destroy humanity, um, it was fascinating to see the people who would follow the Twitter feed, now defunct, where the program, which was connected to the internet, quickly searched, okay, how do I destroy humanity? Okay, nuclear weapons would be good. How do I buy nuclear weapons? Uh, and there was expressing frustration on its Twitter feed that it could not acquire nuclear weapons, which led to all sorts of people encouraging it, saying, don't give up your dreams. So again, I'm more worried about humans. A different kind of problem, and this maybe is closer to the topic of today's discussion, uh, is the more subtle problems associated with generative AI in particular. Uh, and this is one of a series of photographs that I think is really interesting. It's a beautiful photograph. This is uh, completely artificially generated based on a whole bunch of source material which may or may not have been copyrighted. Um, but it's a series of selfies um, a, a, created by artificial intelligence, generative AI, stable diffusion, some of you might have used it. And what's interesting is it's beautiful, it's compelling, and yet the more you look at it, a little bit uncanny. Um, obviously, there were no cameras in the historical periods that are being um, uh, mimicked, um, but also no one in samurai culture would ever have smiled like this. And so what you're looking at uh, is really um, a simulacrum. And so the concern with a lot of this is that, yes, it produces human-like text, but human-like text based on what? Based on the data set it's trained on, which is why all those selfies look a bit like Kardashians or kind of Americans. And I realize that Kevin Spacey should probably not be there, so we'll replace him with um, someone else wearing a bow tie. And this actually goes back through the history of AI. And this is a completely genuine photograph, some of you might have seen, from 1956, Dartmouth College, uh, the conference, well, the research um, two-month period uh, where the term artificial intelligence is widely regarded to have been coined. Uh, and this is useful for a couple of reasons, the first being um, the irrational exuberance. These guys got funding from the Rockefeller Foundation uh, for two months of research on the basis in 1956 that they thought they could pretty much solve many problems associated with artificial intelligence. Clearly, decades later, we're a long way from that. The second reason why I think it's a useful illustration is the complete lack of diversity. A bunch of white guys, middle-aged white guys, like myself and Julian, if I may. Uh, and that points to a different kind of problem in AI, which is the bias issue. Not bias in that the machines are biased, not even bias necessarily in that the individuals are biased, but bias in that it reflects both the, the data going in and the questions it's asked. And for much of that history, it was white guys like this asking the questions. There's much more diversity in AI now in research, um, but a lot of the, di of the underlying data, as many of you will be familiar with, um, does exhibit um, bias. Um, so what are the real legal challenges? Uh, and this is what I've been uh, working on for several years, uh, and I boil it down to sort of three broad challenges of this technology, uh, this suite of technologies, which is maybe a question we can talk about, what we mean when we say AI, if you don't accept ChatGPT's earlier definition. What are the challenges to regulators? Uh, and the first is speed. This is not unique to AI. It goes back through the history of uh, computing in particular. Uh, and a good example of this is the 2010 flash crash, where the New York Stock Exchange lost a trillion dollars in value, the highest ever point drop in its history, even including the global financial crisis, the Great Depression, um, and in 15 minutes brought most of it back. No one knew why. Uh, and then when they studied it, it was basically because of high-frequency trading algorithms, so computers doing trades. And so the regulatory problem is that in theory, when these computers do a trade, it's the same rules that apply to humans. But if Julian and I were doing trades, if we're operating quickly, we might do a few a minute. Uh, these were doing tens of thousands of trades every second, which is how things spiraled out of control. This is not really a conceptual problem for regulation, but it's a practical challenge, and it's why now in Singapore and elsewhere we have circuit breakers, which means if there's the start of a stock going off a cliff, um, everything will automatically stop so that the humans can come in and try and work out what's going on. So I hope that's reasonably clear. So speed is an issue. The second is autonomy. Um, and this is uh, a little bit newer, the idea that machines can take decisions without additional human intervention. 
Uh, and so the autonomous vehicle is an example of this. Uh, and I, I like to ask questions of audiences like yourselves who are interested in uh, these sort of cutting edge technology. Um, how many of you would get into an, a truly autonomous vehicle with no safety driver? Okay, handful, okay. Hands up, who uses artificial intelligence in their daily life? Okay, put your hand up if you use email in your daily life. Okay, you are using artificial intelligence in your daily life, okay. Who would um, use artificial intelligence to work out the shortest distance between two points using something like Google Maps? Many. Who would marry the person an artificial intelligence system told them to marry? Usually there's one or two guys who'll put their hands up, but not, not today, you're way too... So the autonomous question is, is, an, is a challenge, but it also raises, I think, some of the ethical issues that Julian was referring to, because I'm not going to get into trolley problems like who should the machine kill, um, but the threshold for getting into an autonomous vehicle um, is often quite different from getting into a vehicle with a complete stranger who we have no idea whether they're a good driver or not. Um, and all of you will be familiar with news stories about autonomous vehicles that have had crashes, and that's in the order of maybe eight, nine, 10 per year. And you read vastly more about those tiny number of crashes than you do about the million fatalities every year, largely attributed on the roads to human error. Nonetheless, autonomy is a kind of uncanny question. There is this wariness and some legal issues about who you attribute responsibility to, uh, although that's not actually such a, a difficult problem for the law to resolve. Uh, in the case of autonomous vehicles, for example, if I injure one of you because I'm driving carelessly, you might be able to sue me. Um, if I injure you because the car blows up, no point suing me, but you can go after the manufacturer of the car, perhaps. And that's what we will see with autonomous vehicles, is a shift from responsibility of drivers to manufacturers. But the autonomy question does raise some issues in terms of who we attribute responsibility to. The third and the biggest challenge, I think, in the context of medical ethics and the regulation question is opacity. The inability to understand how certain decisions are taken, the black box phenomenon. Uh, and this is an issue um, when we care but often we don't care. And I think Julie and I were both at an event where I was talking about opacity and the challenge for regulation and a doctor piped up that we've been using aspirin for 100 years. We don't know how it works. The problem is even more difficult in psychiatry where there are certain treatments like electroconvulsive therapy, which objectively is useful in certain forms of depression for treatment, but we still don't know how it works and yet we will deploy it. So sometimes we care about opacity, sometimes we don't. Uh, and it goes back, I think, to one of the things Julian was touching on, which is, which is reasons. And, and reasons are very important in certain circumstances, but you need to be thinking about the right questions to be asking. Okay, so if these are the challenges, what should be the response? Well, unfortunately, for most of the 20th century, in the context of regulating robots and AI, we didn't get much further than this guy, Isaac Asimov. Um, some of you might have read his novels, many of you might be familiar with the three laws of robotics. Um, and for much of the 20th century, there was an assumption that what we needed was new rules. Um, this misunderstands the problem as being both too hard and too easy. It misunderstands the problem as being too hard because um, actually most AI use cases can be covered by most laws most of the time. The problem is in the application. And that's why it misunderstands the problem as being too easy because the assumption seems to have been if only we had the right ethical principles mapped out, that would solve the problems. When even in the first short story where he introduced the laws of robotics back in 1942, the laws didn't work. And if he'd been a good legislator, he would have been a terrible science fiction writer because his science fiction was mostly about how the laws didn't work. Nonetheless, um, through the 2010s in particular, and especially from 2016 to 2018, there was a proliferation of literally hundreds of ethical guidelines, principles, frameworks. Um, Singapore now has its Model A governance framework, which I think does some things better than many of these other ones. The Pope signed onto one. Uh, and it really took off in the period 2016 to 2018, partly because that was part of the decade in which machine learning really took off after around 2012. Uh, but also because in that period, I think it became more clear to us that some of the threats associated with AI went beyond just random um, recommendations on your Amazon feed or um, the, uh, the, the possibility that an autonomous vehicle might crash, but it could actually change human history. And that could affect elections in a country like the United States. Uh, and so as the stakes went up, the understanding that we might need to regulate uh, became clear.
So why regulate or why not regulate? And here I'll add a bit of nuance to what um, Julian was saying in terms of the reasons for regulation, that we tend to regulate for two broad sets of reasons. Uh, and I agree reasons are important, but the reasons are not always commensurate. One is to address market failures. Um, and a good example of this is product liability. At the start of the 20th century, if you bought a product, the idea was buyer beware. But as manufacturing processes became more complex through the 20th century, it became clear that putting the onus on consumers to understand the risks of products that they were purchasing was unrealistic and unreasonable. Better to put the risk on the manufacturer who was in a better position to understand those risks and manage them, including through insurance and other mechanisms. And so with product liability, you don't need to prove fault usually. And this is now spread around the world. So that's an example of market inefficiency that we want to address. But it's not always about efficiency. We also regulate in support of social or other policies. So the reason why we uh, prohibit certain forms of discrimination, for example, is not necessarily associated with market efficiency. I'm not saying discrimination would be efficient or not. Most jurisdictions, including Singapore, have certain red lines where they say, well, we're not going to do certain things or allow certain things to happen, regardless of whether they're efficient, because these are values that we hold dear possibly, hopefully, arrived at through a, a kind of rational process uh, like the one that Julian described. Against this is the issue of whether we should regulate at all. Uh, and this is a particular challenge for small jurisdictions, rule takers like Singapore, uh, where there, I think there's a real wariness of constraining innovation or losing your competitive advantage. Uh, and so in Sue's going to be talking about um, stem cell research, and I'm really curious because one example I've been giving of this uh, is the United States, which under President George W. Bush in 2001 uh, initiated a moratorium on stem cell research, uh, which largely led to research going elsewhere, including places like Singapore. Uh, and so there's awareness, particularly, again, a small jurisdiction like Singapore. Uh, and around the world, we've seen three broad approaches uh, to this. We've had the United States, which has broadly left the market to work things out, um, which is one of the challenges right now that we've got these generative AI models, very powerful uh, models, which the celebrated fact that ChatGPT was downloaded by 100 million users very, very quickly, which just meant it was 100 million beta testers. So the, the Americans are letting the market work it out. Europe, which has pretty clearly drawn a red line and said, well, we are going to um, establish certain principles, certain values, and if that means driving innovation elsewhere, so be it. Um, and until a couple of years ago, I would have said China was looking at it not through a market lens like the Americans or a rights lens like the Europeans, but a national sovereignty or national security lens. And, and that's still the case, but China in the last 18 months in particular has really added nuance with certain restrictions that are intended to partly protect the, um, the political authority of the Communist Party, but also by providing a degree of transparency, algorithmic transparency, accountability on the part of large language models that many other jurisdictions are looking at more seriously. Okay, different question then, also applicable to Singapore is, when should we regulate? Uh, and here, uh, there's an example called the Collingridge Dilemma. Uh, this is, goes back to a book published in 1980, the short version of which is, at an early stage of innovation, uh, it's, hard, it's easy to regulate, the costs are low, but you don't know what the harms are. The longer you wait, the clearer the harms become, but the cost goes way up. Uh, and that's the dilemma for, again, small jurisdictions like Singapore. We don't want to regulate too early, in which case we just lose competitive advantage. But if we regulate too late, then we've exposed users, consumers, citizens to risk. Um, in environmental law, there's the idea of the precautionary principle. This is the idea that you shouldn't wait for certainty um, to regulate against harms. Uh, and that's an issue in the climate change space, for example. Uh, and masterly inactivity is a, is a term used, sometimes applicable when, uh, for example, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has established sandboxes to enable um, research and product testing, but limiting the harm. Okay, how should we regulate? Um, often we think about supply rather than demand, um, and I would break it into three broad categories, which I'll, I'll touch on only briefly. Sometimes we just want to manage the risk. Autonomous vehicles, I just want them to be safe. But sometimes I do think we want to draw red lines and say, no, there are no-go areas. And so we can debate it in the medical context. I think one reasonably clear one is in the context of lethal autonomous weapons, uh, where I think humans should be making decisions, not necessarily because humans will make the best decisions, but because humans should be forced to grapple with these life and death decisions, and in particular, because humans should be held to account for those decisions. 
Uh, there's also process legitimacy where we want some decisions not just to be made by any old human, but by a specific human, like a judge is a good example, where the legitimacy of his or her decisions comes not from them being right, uh, although we hope they are, but from the decision being made within a politically accountable framework. Okay, um, who should regulate? I won't go into this in detail except to say standards of self-regulation are going to be important. I think this is something Jin Tzu will be talking about. Um, I think states are important because states are the ones that really have the regulatory hammer, the ability to fine, to imprison, and so on. Um, but I've been arguing for a couple of years now that there should be some measure of international coordination. Uh, and, uh, and Sam Altman, among others, has been talking about the possibility of an international atomic energy agency style agency uh, for artificial intelligence. So this is a fast moving field. This last slide or second last slide is just an example of how quickly things are changing. There was a brief moment when Australia said, yes, an AI can be an inventor that was quickly overturned. Uh, China, I mentioned, is a really interesting space to watch. Uh, America, bless them, are trying to regulate, but Congress can't do anything. Um, there are some examples of the kind of harms attached. I was pleased when Singapore's Chief Justice came out and said, we're at least not gonna hand over sentencing to artificial intelligence. Elon Musk has been talking about risks while investing in AI, and Sam Altman recently came through Singapore on his charm offensive, which some of you might have uh, seen. So in case you're wondering, uh, ChatGPT's uh, extension, um, uh, Chaos GPT, continued on its merry way, trying to end humanity until it went dark, which may just be its most sophisticated way of trying to end humanity by just encouraging us to adopt this new technology. No one knows. Uh, but I did go back and ask ChatGPT, uh, will AI eventually replace leaders and regulators and everyone at tonight's event? Uh, and it offered, as usual, a kind of positive conclusion that, yes, there's the potential, but it's unlikely to completely replace humans like you. You bring strategic thinking. But I would point out the two qualifiers, that it's saying it won't completely replace us, and we're not easily replicated by AI. So if you're interested in learning more, um, I apologize, the next slide is completely shameless. I offer you a blue pill and a red pill. If you would like to know more about the kind of serious side of regulating AI, um, you can look at my, did uh, the book We the Robots, uh, but my reward to myself was a novel, uh, with the red pill. You can look at a more speculative future about AI uh, in the novel Artifice. But thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to In Sue's presentation and a chance to engage with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to keeping so perfectly to time again. So um, our third speaker is um, Dr. In Su Hyun. Dr. Hyun is the director of the Center for Life Sciences and Public Learning at the Museum of Science, Boston, and a member of the Center for Bioethics at the Harvard Medical School. He's the former director of research ethics and a former senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School's Center for Bioethics and was previously the professor of bioethics and philosophy at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine where he taught for 18 years. Specifically in relation to stem cells, he was involved or is involved in the International Society for Stem Cell Research and has, has helped draft all of their international research guidelines. So could you please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Hyun who will be speaking on rapidly advancing stem cell technologies, regulations versus guidelines. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to address a question that I get a lot, which is, what's the difference between guidelines and regulations? And when would you want to go with guidelines? And when do you want to go with regulations? I'm going to try to answer that question in relation to my experience in the stem cell field. So in the case of stem cell technologies, uh, many of you already know this, we have a range of activities. Right? We have a whole lot of activities that we might call basic research or fundamental research, trying to unlock the mysteries of developmental biology, for example, and disease modeling all the way to eventually clinical uses of stem cell derived products, including also uh, the patient's own stem cells transplanted back into them, and everything in between. So to give you some examples, um, in the basic side, the most noteworthy areas that have been getting a lot of attention lately are uh, constructs that are made in the lab that are derived from stem cells that we call organoids, uh, there have been a, uh, a lot of really interesting work on embryo models, 
And so these are all things that are combined in a dish, right? And uh, are not yet going into any living being, whether it's an animal or a patient. Um, we also have kind of in that middle range, what are called human animal chimeras, where you put human stem cells or most likely human stem cell derivatives into laboratory animals for a number of reasons. One might be simply to better characterize your stem cells. There's a technology called induced pluripotent stem cells where you can take any kind of body cell, including peripheral blood, and reprogram it to behave like embryonic stem cells. How do you know that these are truly induced pluripotent stem cells? You normally have to put it into an immune deficient mouse in the kidney capsule or in the testes, and after a few months, if it truly is pluripotent, it'll create a a teratoma, so it's a cancerous mass that has cells derived from all three germ lineages of the human. Um, so just to even qualify your stem cell line as pluripotent, you have to do a human animal test. The FDA and other regulatory authorities, before you can move to clinical trials in humans with your stem cell based biologic, require proof of principle and safety studies and animal models. So again, if you're going to move to the clinic, a necessary step would be right now animal testing. So when you do that, you put human cell populations that integrate into the animal model and you create an, an animal that has functionally uh, human cells in it. And then of course we have clinical uh, trials where we're going through a clinical trials process. You're using the stem cell biologic in patients in the phase one, two, three, sometimes four study. And then we have medical innovation that sidesteps entirely the clinical trials process and goes directly to human use. Typically, these are going to be the patient's own stem cells that are removed from the body, minimally manipulated, ideally, but there's always something that goes on, and then put right back into the part of the body where they're normally found. And where FDA comes in is if you more than minimally manipulate these cells or if you put them in a part of the body that they are normally not found, then FDA tries to step in. So there's an enormous range of activities, and uh, you may wonder, you know, so where do guidelines come into play? And where do regulations come into play? So to answer that question, we have to have a pretty basic understanding of the differences between guidelines and regulations. Um, typically, guidelines are quick to assemble. They, they, they come relatively quickly together. They can be rather flexible and adaptive over time because the process is really not that involved. So the example will be the International Society for Stem Cell Research, ISCR guidelines. And there, we, um, you know, we, we come up with these guidelines pretty frequently. And to do that, you assemble an international task force made up of various experts, usually a group of scientists, a group of people who have some expertise in research ethics and bioethics, people who understand policy, and we draw from international, um, international cohorts. So that way, you get a very diverse perspective. Right? We, we, we get people on the task force that have a background in developmental biology, background in genetics, background in tissue engineering, organ transplantation. I'm just like taking out just the roster in my mind. Uh, philosophers, right? lawyers, it's very diverse. And then we also have public consultants that come in to review uh, versions of the draft. It's bottom up because it kind of comes from the community of researchers and people who are active in the field. Unfortunately, there's no formal enforcement, so I often get asked whenever we roll out the guidelines, I've was involved in every single one of these, um, you know, what, do you, what happens if someone violates the guidelines? And it's sort of like, well, it's kind of like British police, you know, you say stop, or I'll say stop again, right? Um, you don't really like punish people for that. There are some like soft enforcement mechanisms, for example, um, the, the Nature series of journals now adopts ISSR guidelines and says, you know, as, a, as a condition for publishing in our journal, you have to have followed the guidelines. So there's that. There's a peer pressure, right? Uh, but nothing really with a lot of bite to it. Now, regulation, on the other hand, can be pretty slow to get geared up. Um, because it's slow and because the process is quite involved, it can be very difficult to revise that. And, uh, you know, the, the, the bonus, though, is that it's the process for which, ideally, anyway, it's politically legitimate and uh, it's top-down and it's enforceable. So the example I gave was uh, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. This was an institute that was set up from Proposition 71, which was a law that was passed in California that allocated $3 billion of taxpayer money for stem cell research, and is actually, to get to Simon's point, this was the direct result of the Bush policy that made it restrictive to do uh, research in, in the United States 
and to fund it. And so California kind of set up their own mini NIH, so to speak, for this particular area using taxpayer funds. So in order to do that, it had to be encoded into law. And what was really fascinating about that process was Prop 71 had a whole series of initially there were like guidelines, kind of said like, here are the guidelines for egg donation, here are the guidelines for embryo use, here are the guidelines for informed consent, et cetera. When it became law, you actually had to follow all that and it's very difficult to change. So some of the things that it came up with that we actually differed in the ICCR guidelines was, can you pay egg donors who, as healthy volunteers, provide eggs for stem cell projects? And we said, we now say, uh, that's permissible under compensation for research volunteers based on your own locale. CIRM says that's unethically derived. It's un not only, no, but it's unethical to do that. Uh, so that's a big difference and that's very hard to change. Um, the other difference is now we say it's possible to go beyond 14 days of continuous cultivation of the natural embryo to study it. And California said not, not only 14, it's 12. You can't go beyond 12. And, uh, and to change that, you would have to change the law. So yeah, enforceable, but again, kind of clunky and hard to keep up. So why is that important for what we're talking about here? Science is going very quickly, okay? And so, um, my view is that when you're kind of more on the basic exploratory side, where maybe the risk is not too high, you're not going to hurt an animal, it's all in vitro, you're not going to hurt a human being, you should kind of let the science breathe a little bit and also be able to adapt very quickly based on what you're learning about the science. When you start getting more toward, you know, kind of like, like starting with animals and animal welfare, and getting over to uh, clinical trials, clearly there's already regulation in place. There's already regulation in biomedical sciences for animal welfare and animal research, clearly. So that's already there. We don't have to reinvent that wheel or, or we really don't want to change that too much. And then all the way to human subjects research, there's very clear regulations there. Um, so what can guidelines say? We can help kind of inform a little bit. That's why the, the, the triangle gets very thin there. We can say in human trials, you know, make sure if this is a stem cell based clinical trial, you consult with developmental biologists, you consult during the review of this at your institution, people who might be able to provide supplemental expertise, right? But they're clearly not taking over the role of human subjects research and protections um, there. Similarly, kind of in the middle there with human animal chimera research, um, Clearly there are regulations in place for animal welfare. You may want to consult with people who may be able to tell your animal research committee, that's by law, has to be there, um, you know, what things to look out for, for animal welfare, unexpected results, or what are the anticipated um, impacts on the animal. So, so I think that there's room for breathing. So I'm gonna just focus on, um, for the rest of my talk, on organoids and embryo models, just to give an idea of like how complex that is and why it's sort of challenging to maintain this idea of let the science breathe when some people kind of are, are um, a little bit panicked by some of the reports that are coming out of this area and want the assurance of regulation. So, so I know that that's still quite a contentious area, but I'm gonna argue that uh, for now we want guidelines. Um, now, the other thing I should note is for the last version, the most current version of the ICCR guidelines, the 2021 version, uh, I was the chairperson of the subcommittee that looked at human animal chimera research and organoid research. And if you look at those 2021 guidelines, there's not a whole lot, well, there's, there's quite a bit new for the animal research, but not a whole lot in organoids. And that's because the science is still pretty new. We kind of have to see where it's going, and we didn't want to come with, with guidelines for all time. All we needed was guidelines for the next five years to see where we are with the science. Okay, so that bottom-up approach, a collaborative approach where Legislators may not actually be consulting that much with the scientists who are doing the work, but the ISSCR guidelines, the guidelines level, is quite dynamic. We can always be brought up to date by the people who are working on the field so that we don't, over, we don't over regulate or over, uh, overly restrict the field and not let it actually develop um, more uh, organically. So organoids, um, you know, I, I headed up this project that looked at human brain organoids uh, for the NIH working with the scientists again, so the collaborative approach of people who are doing research in the brain organoid field. So organoids are three-dimensional models that you can create using pluripotent stem cells, either embryonic or the kind that you derive from patients. The kind you derive from patients are especially interesting here because you can create organoid models that are disease-specific, patient-specific versus normal controls. And these are really quite fascinating because they seem to self-organize into these very rudimentary structures that recapitulate the development of these various organ systems. Um, 
if Hank Greeley were here, he would say the two things people worry most about are brains and gonads, and I found that those are actually true for the organoid field. Brain organoids kind of, you know, stir up a lot of concern, and so do I think as they're uh, d um, coming in the near future, gonadal organoids of, of um, testes and ova, uh, uh, sorry, uh, ovaries would also be some concern. Um, so for that, we thought, well, we need to kind of see where the research is going. Where it's going now is that each uh, region, each brain organoid, is not a complete model of the human brain. It only kind of models one particular region at a time. So if you can actually create a, a model of the, of the more complex human brain, you have to create what I call assembloids. This is a graphic from uh, our colleague in the project, Sergio Pashka from Stanford, who uh, does this really amazing work where he'll co-culture or he'll combine organoids uh, from the brain from different regions and kind of create the signaling that happens. He did this one project that was really quite fascinating where he put a human cerebral cortex organoid, he paired it with a spinal cord organoid, and he put on the other end of that a muscle organoid and got the muscle fibers to twitch by sending signals from the brain organoid. Okay, so a little bit more dynamic models. And what we said in the ICSR guidelines is right now, these little models in addition are not capable of creating any kind of consciousness or any kind of experience. They're not even as complex as the fly brain, and we do all kinds of things with fruit flies, right? So, uh, so kind of let it, let it develop, let it, and we'll see where we are in the next five years. I think where we're going to be in the next five years is a lot more of this assembloid work. Um, and so we're just keeping an eye on it, okay? Embryo models are really kind of the, the the thing that I want to um, zero in on now, because this has really been quite in the news lately for the past week, two weeks. And that is, um, not only do stem cells, when you put them in a dish, recapitulate particular organ systems, but they can also start to recapitulate the very early stages of embryo development. So um, that, that disc on the lower uh, right, that was the very first embryo model experiment that's been done, that was 2014. This is the Ali Brivenlu lab at the Rockefeller University. What they found was that if you put human stem cells on a, a you know, two-dimensional um, dish that has these little stipple dots that keep the cells organized in a particular geometric shape, you can do triangles, circles, squares, any shape. They found that if you put them in a circle of a certain diameter, and you just give it a little nudge of BMP, which is a bone growth factor, they self-organize again and again, repeatedly, it doesn't matter which stem cell line you use, repeatedly into this amazing pattern, which if you can see, there are three main rings. The outer ring is endoderm, which represents the, the, the gut, uh, th that layer. Next layer in is mesoderm, which is blood and bone. And then the, the inner layer, which is ectoderm, which is um, uh, skin and brain, right? It does that again and again. Something just amazing about the signaling capacity. There's, there are no cells in the outer ring, so that signals something different, and it goes from the outside in. This is two-dimensional. It's not very realistic, but this, it, it, it's amazing that it has this self-organizing ability. So then what scientists have done is they use three dimensions. They said, well, that two-dimensional thing is not really very uh, useful for, for study. Uh, so now there are three dimensions. On the left side, we have all these mouse embryo models made from mouse stem cells. On the right, you have the human. Um, so it's really been taking off. Uh, so I was a uh, lead author on this one report that we published about the need for some discussion about the ethics of this kind of work. Um, just to give an idea of, of where things have gone um, since that, that, that initial 2014 paper, this one it was really interesting because this is a, a paper which uh, was published in Nature uh, from the Jingping Fu Lab at University of Michigan. And, uh, and so I was a consultant on this one. He, Jingping and I were, were um, I, I was the PI on a project when he was one of my uh, co-investigators where we were trying to come up with bioengineering ethics as kind of a new, a new approach to doing um, bioethics. And his system was really quite fascinating. So, so he, he was trained as a mechanical engineer. He did not like the embryo model systems of that time uh, because they're all kind of, they're all pretty different. You put the, the models in a, in a culture system, they develop at different time rates, they're different sizes, there's just a lot of heterogeneity of them, and that's just not great for science to have that kind of hodgepodge. So he came up with a system using a microfluidic two-channel system, a very basic system where you load up the top channel with human stem cells. It could be, again, embryonic stem cells, it could be iPS, it doesn't matter, as long as they're pluripotent. And you put them in a system where they go through this, this little, like, you know, um, gateway, 
and they get hit with the chemical bath all at the same time. And what this does is it, it generates reproducibly large batches of, the, of these identical stem cell-based embryo models. This gets in just a couple of days what uh, would be about day 10 post-fertilization, but they're incomplete. Um, but it's really quite interesting because when you do this, you have this, this generator of embryo models that you can use for drug screening. I asked him, well, why, why did you develop this? And he said, because um, most of the drugs that women take when they're pregnant have zero data on the, uh, what effects it has on the developing embryo and fetus, and so this would be a way to, to test the safety of drugs on all these different model systems of the embryo. But I said, okay, Jinping, you're in the state of Michigan, and, and according to law and regulation there, uh, human cloning is illegal. They didn't really quite define human cloning very well. But I said, if you use IPS cells, then some legislator in Michigan will say this is a human cloning machine and will uh, put you in jail. So I said, please, no matter what you do, make your model such that you leave something out. And so this is what they put in their ethics statement. They're incomplete. They lack the ability to do two, form two main things. They can't form yolk sac and placenta, therefore they're not real embryos or embryo-like entities that can do the work that they're hoping it could do for uh, humanity, for benefit, without raising this issue of are you, are you setting up a, you know, a cloning factory at the, in your lab at uh, University of Michigan. So not everybody follows my advice about leave something out, don't make it complete, because now the next big thing that happened was human blastoids. These are embryo models that try to recapitulate everything, including those cells that will eventually become the yolk sac and the placenta. Right? So those are the parts that Jinping left out. Well, what these are trying to do, they're trying to recapitulate what are the stages of the embryo that they actually transfer into the womb at fertility clinics. They're, that's called the blastocyst stage. They look like that. But, um, but maybe you can make those same stage embryos using stem cells. And so two teams reported on this, Jun Wu's lab in, uh, in Texas and Jose Polo's lab in uh, Melbourne, uh, Australia. Uh, so Jun Wu's methodology is on the top, Jose Polo's methodology is on the bottom. They start differently in the beginning, but they end up with the same thing, this, this three-dimensional model of basically the pre-implantation embryo. Um, so this is not trying to leave anything out. They're actually trying to recapitulate the, the, the entire thing that you actually see in the fertility clinic. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Magdalena Zernishka Gutz uh, was at Boston at the ICCR meeting there, and she gave a plenary talk, and she pre presented some unpublished data, which was actually published yesterday in, in Nature, so it just came out yesterday, uh, where she said, you know, she's able to make uh, embryo models that are post-implantation. Right, so um, the Jose Polo and the others, they did the pre-implantation blastoid work. She, would, she leapfrogged over that, and in a few days was able to make um, an embryo model that represented yolk sac cell lineages, placenta cell lineages, and the embryo pop proper, those cell lineages. And, was, and so they announced that kind of casually at the meeting. You know, it's unpublished, but she mentioned it, and so there was a reporter in the audience who put that in The Guardian the same afternoon, like it, it appeared online a few hours later. And, uh, and so that, was, that created this whole stir that started, um, I think, a lot of news that you may have read about synthetic embryos being created in the lab recently, and then the fact that there's no regulation, there's no guidelines. Uh, that's not actually true. But that was just published yesterday, that's uh, Magda's paper. Uh, finally, just came out, and another group that I didn't know about from Yale did another uh, similar one. So two papers came out yesterday. Um, on my way here, I had a layover in uh, Seattle, and the reporter from the AP News called me, and she interviewed me at the gate <laughs> so I was take, before I got on my international flight. So this came out also yesterday, and this is again kind of getting to the issue of like, you know, what are these models capable of doing? Should we be afraid of them or not? So let me just kind of cut to, because I just have a couple minutes, let me just cut to like where I see this issue. So here's a case study of like, do we need regulations? Do we need guidelines? There is in that first category of in vitro research. It's not in an animal yet. It's not in a, a, a human yet. So let me tell you uh, where the current landscape is. It's a mixture. We have regulation and then we have guidelines. So let me start with the regulations. Because people have said uh, in these news stories, it's rather sensational news stories, you know, uh, there, it's, it's the Wild West, right? Um, scientists are creating these synthetic embryos and uh, there's nothing that, that prevents them from being used for reproduction. Well, there is actually. Okay, so there's FDA. FDA will not allow any complex biological products to be put into a human being 
without FDA oversight and approval first. So you couldn't just take any of these embryo models and just put them into the womb and think you can get away with it uh, uh, you know, without penalty. Um, guidelines exist as well. So our ISSR guidelines say embryo models should all be reviewed by committees, but uh, where the no-go zone is is you can't put it into a human or non-human uterus. Okay? Now, what if someone were to try to break the rules and kind of skirt around regulation and just kind of just go ahead? Well, here's where the collaboration with the scientists is extremely important to, and to get this information across for people who are thinking of regulation. Currently, it's not possible for any of these to make a baby. So let's start with the post-implantation models. The post-implantation models have just come out in nature that everyone's talking about. Uh, when you talk to the people who work on them, when you talk with embryologists and also fertility clinic experts, they say, those are too far along. You can't just put them into the womb and think you can establish a pregnancy. Because that mimics a period of time in which the embryo has burrowed deep into the uterine lining and it's built all around it, this like little cozy home of other extra embryonic tissue structures. You, the, the, the unpregnant uterus is not prepared for something like that. So you put it in, it's probably nothing's going to happen except maybe you're going to have some unknown cell types that migrate and could cause a tumor. So they're dangerous in that way. Okay, so bio biologically they're not capable of making a baby. What about, because the reporters asked me this one, what about the pre-implantation models, the blastoise? Can those make a baby? Because those are modeling the stage that actually goes into the uterus in a fertility clinic. And so uh, what the scientists tell me is to make those, you have to use what are called um, naive state stem cells. So you make embryonic stem cells or iPS cells, you have to actually go a step further and scrub off all the genomic imprinting from the parents to make them truly naive state. If you don't do that, they will not make that blastoid model. Well, guess what? You need the parental imprints for fetal development. So it, gets, it would get to the point where it needs the imprints, doesn't have them, and it just collapses. So bio, biologically, they're not viable. So those are the kind of the two points. They're too far along, or uh, the way that they're made simultaneously cripples their ability to go further. This is all important knowledge. Why? Because there are people, I'm sure, right now clamoring for laws like the one in Michigan without really kind of understanding and defining what cloning is. They're like, like different versions of it, I guess. Just to say it's against the law. You can't do human embryo modeling. I, 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 can, I can see that discussion probably happening right now because people are really afraid. So right now, I think what we need are guidelines to kind of say where the science goes. Too early for law, and, and when regulation comes in, it might actually stifle the field. And it's really important, I think, for these models to go ahead because we want to get to a point where you can do all kinds of uh, safety testing and other things on these models that could benefit persons and humanity uh, and not stifle that. Um, so that's just an example of where I think this uneasy space may be between regulations or guidelines, it kind of depends on the context where you are on that continuum when you start involving animals and humans and this possibility for harm. Yeah, of course, you want to work within the regulatory structure that's already set up to prevent uh, harm there as much as possible. Where you're more kind of in the exploratory early phases, let the science breathe, understand more before you come in with regulations. And I say that because in Australia, they already define blastoids as human embryos. And so now you actually have to get a license and all this other stuff. So too bad for the <laughs> embryo modelers in, in Australia, they're going to have a tough time doing their research. I asked the people in the UK, because the UK has a regulatory authority for embryo research, are you going to also, like Australia, you know, govern, like, are you going to have reach through on the blast story work? And they said, probably not, because we don't think they're really embryos right now from what we're hearing. They're not, they're not equivalent. So it would, be, it would be wrong to step in and kind of take hold of that. So that's all I have. I'm really interested in having our discussion with you, and thank you for your time.